Today, we are talking to Anna McMaster, who is a certified senior advisor and the owner of Care Patrol of Austin. She specializes in guiding families through the process of finding senior living and care options, such as assisted living, independent living, and memory care. She has a particular soft spot for seniors diagnosed with dementia-related illnesses, as she herself went through the daunting process of finding care for a loved one with vascular dementia. Anna considers herself passionate about empowering seniors and their families during a time when many emotional and practical issues must be considered. Prior to her career in senior living, Anna was an HR and recruitment director, which required excellent interpersonal skills and very often patience. She brings this experience into her work with families. Welcome to the Listen for Life podcast with Genevieve Richardson. Genevieve is a speech language pathologist rehabilitating adults with communication challenges after a stroke or due to a neurological impairment. Living with aphasia is hard. Caregiving is hard. You are not alone. Get equipped with knowledge from experts in the field and professionals you need to know. We'll hear stories and experiences from others who are navigating life with aphasia. So. Put your earphones in and take a walk outside. This isn't just a podcast. This is a community, a resource, and a support system. We're in this together. Do life. Welcome, Anna. How are you? I'm really good. I'm so happy to be here with you. This is Anna from Care Patrol. And Anna, tell us a little bit about your company. So, Care Patrol is one of the largest placement agencies in the country. We help families find senior living options like independent living, assisted living, memory care. And it's much like working with a realtor. We tour with our clients, we guide them through the process, and it is a free community service. I own Care Patrol of Austin, so I work anywhere from Georgetown down to San Marcos. I've owned it for three years now, and yeah, that's, that's Care terrific. Patrol. It's, I'm really excited to be speaking with you today and educating our audience about what Care Patrol can provide and how many resources and emotional support that you are able to provide to people that need to get into a different living situation. Because that's often, it's often a tough thing. It's a, a tough emotionally, financially, and I know that you are here to help them do that. Yes, I am typically brought in when the process is really emotional, really stressful. And my goal is to be a guide and a resource and a friend and a good listener and really help people make the right choice so that they can find safe and affordable senior living. Tell us a little bit about how you got into this business and then we'll get into some more meat about the business. Well, my background is corporate HR and recruitment. I had a a very good kind of corporate career, was climbing the corporate ladder, but my husband and I were thrown into a situation where we had to be long distance caregivers for my father-in-law who had vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. And we knew nothing about the disease. We knew nothing about caregiving. We knew nothing about facilities. So it was a really, really stressful time and trying to find the right care for him took a a lot longer than it should have. We did go through the process. We did find him the right place in the end. But Care Patrol kind of fell into my lap. I was looking around at franchises and trying to break away from the corporate world. And this just really spoke to me. And I immediately got on board with their values and providing this kind of resource for families just so that no one would ever have to go through what we went through. Interesting how you were thrown into, not thrown into, that's not the right term, how you found your next passion based on your family circumstances to get into this business. And you have a real mission. 
I do. And it's something that I never really had in my career before finding that kind of, you know, the warm fuzzies that keep you going, but nobody knows what it's like to be a caregiver until you have to go through it. And it just made me really want to get out there and educate people and help people. And, you know, the bonus is that I have fulfillment in my career as well. Can you give us an example Maybe the ideal client that would come to you at Care Patrol and maybe somebody that's coming to your, to you seeking services. That's not an ideal, not that it's not an ideal client, but not an ideal circumstance. Right. Yeah. So unfortunately I can't do much with Medicaid. And I get a lot of Medicaid calls. So people who just don't have the money for the private pay facilities, Medicare will never cover assisted living. So, which is, unfortunately, I have to tell people that all the time. I hate being the voice of doom. So when it comes to Medicaid, I always point people in the right direction, but unfortunately I can't help. The ideal client for me is somebody who either has the funds for long-term care, and that may be assets and a house and all of that, or maybe they're a veteran and they have not tapped into all the benefits that that can entail, or maybe they have long-term care insurance. What I would imagine you would prefer people to understand, families to understand what Care Patrol is before they need it. What would you say about that? Yes. I hear all the time. People are like, I wish I knew about your service three years ago. So my mission is really to get out there and educate people that this resource exists, that you don't have to look for senior living on your own. You can use someone like me and my knowledge and my expertise to help guide you through you know, a myriad of choices. But my big thing with families is also have the talk early with your loved ones. And what I mean by that is, is not just, you know, wills and power of attorney, but what does your loved one want in the long term? What kind of situation is going to make that person thrive and be engaged? A great example of this is actually my own parents. My father is an introvert. He loves reading. He is not somebody that wants to get out there and and be involved with social activity. So he's been very clear about what he wants his care to look like should something happen. My mother, on the other hand, is a social butterfly and she loves to get in with groups and she loves to socialize. So it's kind of having that conversation so that when we get to the point where we need to look for senior living, we have an idea of what's going to make those people happy. How can you help a family if, let's say, grandma accidentally fell down and broke her hip and now she's in the hospital? And she's in a two-story home and lives alone. And I would imagine you get calls in the middle of the night for um, near emergency situations where families are scrambling. Yes, unfortunately I do. And typically what happens is something exactly like what you said. There's a fall or there's a medical incident that required a hospital admission. I usually will help the family then find a rehab Medicare is great. After you've had a hospital admission, they will cover 20 days of rehab. So that gives us a little bit of time while grandma is getting PT or OT or speech or whatever it is. And then in the meantime, we are looking for that long-term option. I have families that sometimes grandma is not ready for the permanent commitment. So we do respite stays. So we look at an assisted living where you go into a lovely furnished apartment. It's a day rate. You get all your food and activities and Nine times out of 10, they figure out that that's actually the safest option and they stay. But I have other situations where, you know, we need to find assisted living very, very quickly. Admission can be anywhere from two to five days. We can make it happen as quickly as possible. But my service is here are your top options. Here are three options. Let's look at those. Let's target those. These are the ones that we should look at rather than Googling assisted living as you're sitting at the hospital. I at would imagine, I mean, as much as I love Google for most everything, I would imagine that's a pretty stressful situation for a family member to be in. If you're the adult daughter and now you've got to start making these decisions, because as we all know, websites look pretty 
but they may not reflect what that facility looks like. And I say facility in general terms. I'm, I've, in my home health career, I've been in a lot of them and some are better than others. Tell us more about how you yeah. assess a facility and how can you bridge the gap between what the website looks like and what they say they offer and what the reality is? Well, the big thing that I do is the background work. So there are inspection and violation histories available online through the Texas HHS. And I go through all of those. I do that on a pretty regular basis with all of the communities that I work with, because it doesn't matter how beautiful they are. If they've got some kind of violation history, that's a big deal. And that's not something a website is going to tell you. The other thing, and I always kind of say this with a, a little a little smirk, but I am a gossip hound and I love to know what is happening inside the buildings. I keep up with all of my clients who I've placed because I want them to tell me what is it like you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, what kind of care are you getting? And, and really just, you know, what, what does it look like after the salespeople have done their big pitch? The other thing is that particularly if you stick your name into a website and it blasts your details out to everybody, you're going to get a lot of calls from a lot of salespeople. And the last thing you want when you are in a stressful, emotional situation is fending off salespeople. So that is another facet of my job, which is to be the kind of middle person between my client and the salespeople to really kind of be respectful of not only their data, but just also their emotional and, and yeah, the state of mind, really. Just blew my mind with the thought of an adult child is trying to find placement for mom. She gets on somebody's website and now her data is out there and she's going to start getting calls from all these other facilities. That is just so creepy to me. Beyond that, but in this adding the emotional stress of the situation, trying to find placement, that's just wrong. Not that you have anything to do with it, but folks, you got to protect your data. You yeah. got to get a VPN. <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, not a sponsor. Oh, no, nothing makes exactly. my blood boil. Yeah. Let's. <laughs> yeah. And people don't realize yeah. that. People uh, don't realize because that. these are businesses, these assisted living facilities. Most of the time, do all assisted living facilities have le different levels of care where you can go in like in an apartment independent living, and then maybe you need a little more help, you transition to assisted, and then maybe they also have skilled nursing on the same property. Independent living is a community where you're going to get meals, you're going to get socialization and activities. Sometimes they offer transport to doctor's appointments or outings. And it's a monthly rate that just includes your utilities and maintenance and all of that. So it's a great option when people don't really need medical care, but they just need to be in a place where they are getting out there and enjoying life. Assisted living is the next step when you start to need some help with what we call ADLs, activities of daily living. And that's showering, dressing, bathing, maybe transferring from bed to a chair or your walker and all that. And yes, there are, are levels of care. So when you're looking at assisted living, they will do an assessment to determine what level of care goes on top of your monthly rate. And then memory care is a secured facility. It's typically an all-inclusive price for everything, including incontinence needs. And that's really for people who are what we call exit seeking, or they are at risk of causing harm to themselves or others or they've reached the final stages of dementia where they need quite a high level of care. Skilled nursing is, you know, when you need that 24 seven medical care, you need nurses and doctors on site at all times. There are only a few places here in Austin that actually have all four levels of care. They're called CCRCs and they, they work a little bit differently. They typically have a buy-in fee. And the idea is you buy into the community when you're kind of at independent living level and then you age in place throughout the rest of the, the journey. We do have a couple of places that are assisted living and independent living that have a skilled nursing attached, but it's it's not as, as common as you think. Most of the skilled nursings are standalone facilities. 
I worked most of my career in California and they had a lot of what you're describing as the CCRCs there. And people would buy into the apartment, like they'd sell their house, they'd buy into the apartment with a big lump sum. And, you know, I know there's lots of variety out there. And I know that you know these facilities here in Austin and can really help guide a family with the education and information they need to find the right spot. Yes, absolutely. When I first started this, I went and visited every single community in my in my territory and took lots and lots of pictures, lots and lots of notes because they do start to blur into one another after a while. And I work with over 100 communities. So, you know, I am keeping a very close eye on food, activities, staff turnover, you know, care levels, nurses, all these kind of things. Those are, those are what I I'm looking out for as opposed to the pretty chandelier and the right. nice pool. Yeah. Window dressings. It's, it, it, it's all, window about, dressings. It's all about the care. <laughs> and when you are in a facility as a, as a clinician, as I was for many, many years, you know, the good facilities and it can be bright and shiny and lovely and inviting on the inside, but then folks are not getting the care they need. Or for myself as a clinician, if I needed to work with the staff in the dining room for somebody with a swallowing problem and we needed to modify diet, some facilities, it was really hard to get anybody to take responsibility for that. Although when my, my patient went into the facility, they were assured that, oh yes, absolutely. We can take care of that service for you. So I think it's really important to have an advocate for like yourself, for these families that need something specific. Maybe mom had a stroke and she needs a modified diet. Plus she needs help with ADLs and she needs help with getting her laundry done and she needs to get to the doctor. You know, and she's got a whole stable full of doctors that's, you know, her whole social calendar is built around making these doctor visits. It's important to find the right facility for mom. Yeah. And, you know, so many people, particularly the the older generation, have this idea that a senior community looks like a nursing home and everyone's sitting in a wheelchair watching TV. And that's just not true anymore. And there really are options for for people that, you know, they're still independent and they want to be independent. They just need to have kind of a cushion of of help, you know, and I love I love when people don't really understand what independent living is and I get to explain that to them and they go, oh, my gosh, that's that's perfect. That's exactly what we need. You know, we need a pendant. We need a concierge. But mom doesn't want somebody to come in and help her bathe. She doesn't need that. You just want to keep them as independent and engaged as, as possible. And going back to, you know, taking things at face value. Another thing that I love introducing people to is residential care homes, which is, you know, a, a home in a neighborhood that has been licensed in the same way as a bigger assisted living, but the, the ratio from caregiver to resident is much, much better, typically maybe eight to 10 residents per house. And you really get an excellent level of care. And in fact, right now I've got somebody in a, in a place where she will eventually go home, but right now it's not safe. She needs kind of a buffer between the hospital and rehab and home. And she's gone into this wonderful residential care home where she is getting just doted on and really getting back to strength. So that's another option that people just never think of. But it's a re- it can be a really, really and good those one. Those homes are monitored by the state. They have lots of rules and regulations. This is not like if I wanted to convert my home to it, it's not something that can just happen. I just want the audience to understand that this is fully regulated, vetted. You know, everybody has background checks and the facility, you know, you have your wheelchair access and, you know, all of the boxes are checked for these residential care homes. Absolutely. It is quite an undertaking to transform a home into a residential care home. It really is. And what I find particularly here in Austin, a lot of the owners of these places are actually physical therapists and they have a really great eye 
for setting up the house so that it is it is safe. So a lot of people who are fall risks, residential care home can be such a great option, particularly if it's, if it's run by- I'm pretty sure when I was doing home health in California, none of the residential care homes were owned by a PT, but I can absolutely see how that can make a difference because it's all about mobility. Everything seems to flow after, once mobility is taken care of and safety is taken care of, then we can work on our speech. Then we can work on our ADLs. So me being a, a transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary and clinician all these years, I love that because I love working as a team. That just, it's another great option for, for our folks that need it. So let's walk through real quick. Walk us through what it would look like. A family contacts you and what are next steps? What are What is the process they might expect? Well, the first thing that I do is a, is a care discovery. So that's a meeting either with the adult children or the senior or all the, you know, the stakeholders who are involved. And it's really important at this meeting that I understand medical needs, financial needs, geographical needs, but also you know, social and kind of spiritual, those kind of needs as well. I want to get a holistic picture of of the senior. It nine times out of 10, it's with the adult child, but I have been in all sorts of situations for care discoveries. It's been at the, you know, bedside at a hospital. I've done Zooms where we've had five siblings. So it really depends, but it's very important for me to get all that information. After that, I'm going to put together a short list of my recommended communities. I don't like to overwhelm people, particularly when they are in that stressful situation. So I usually only give maybe three to four top options. I'll send it over with prices and pictures and further information about care. And then I will set up tours for the family. The tours, you know, it's not a requirement that I come, but a lot of people find that it's useful because again, going back to being, you know, stressed and being emotional, they forget to ask questions. And so I am there to just be like, Hey, wait, back up. Let's talk about this. And when they choose the, uh, the facility, I will help them negotiate contracts. I will help them arrange assessments, get the paperwork done, whatever we need to do to make sure that 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 person is admitted as quickly as possible. So you brought up a point that I wanted to, to just touch on. I've been, and it's all on me, but I've been talking about seniors that need you, that need your services or adult children that are seeking your services. But there's also a circumstance where you can have a working age person who possibly had a stroke, has some kind of neurologic condition going on, broke his knee, broke his hip, and he needs something temporary. Just because you need something temporary doesn't mean they can't contact you. This is not, you're not committing to a lifetime, folks, by working with Care Patrol to get into a facility. This can be as temporary as it needs to be. Let somebody help you make these decisions. Absolutely. And look, I've been contacted by parents who have children that have intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities. And and I'm talking about children in their 30s and 40s, and they need to find a place. I've had people who have been injured at, at work, and they do need that rehabilitation and respite. Typically with the senior living communities, sure. there is an age minimum, you know, so those, those are, are, it's really arbitrary. It's, it's like 62, but there are other options out there for younger people, working people that you might not find on Absolutely. Google. And it, I would imagine a family might not even know what to put in the search bar in Google. They don't even know what to ask for unless somebody has unless they're in the industry in some way, or they're getting coached, you know, by the social worker or the discharge planner, whatever the case may be. Yeah. I, I can just see so much value for families and to just help them with this transition. All right. So we're about to wrap up. What is your goal for families to know before they need to seek your services? Well, going back to what I said at the beginning, it's, it's never too early to have the talk. You know, 
we have to normalize these conversations around long-term plans. And we really have to think about what are we going to do in an emergency? And people don't like to think about that, but you have to, because there's a good chance that you will find yourself in that situation. And you want to know what are the needs What are the wants of your loved one? Also, I'm a big advocate of of getting things in place, getting wills in place, powers of attorney, talk to a good elder care lawyer, really get those things in place. I can't tell you how stressful it is for people, particularly if they have a loved one who who has dementia, if towards the, the, the end of that disease, they don't have these things in place. It's so important to have that conversation. And, you know, going back to to what do they need or want, what are the special things, you know? And I recently came across, it's it's kind of a Swedish theory that we don't need to hold on to all of the things in our life. So what, what are the most important things, right? And I was up at my parents' house and we were going through their house And they were saying, these are the important things. This is what you're going to get. This is what your sister is going to get. And it's not a morbid conversation. It's actually very much, you know, these are our wishes. And let's talk about this now rather than in an emergency situation. When you can be clear minded versus emotional, because as many of Mm -hmm. the clients that I work with every day for speech pathology, once that emotion starts creeping up or that stress creeps up, your thinking mind goes down. It's an inverse relationship as I think of it. So we want to get people thinking ahead of time, planning, be proactive, have those key conversations as much as we can. So let's lighten the mood just for a second. So we know a little more about you because I think you're a dynamic woman. You have a mission. You are passionate about what you do. I love what you do for, for people, for mankind, for Austin. So Tell me, is there something interesting in your refrigerator right now that you can tell us about? I just think I love these just general (laughs) random questions. Go ahead. Yeah. So I have a bottle of Pisco in my refrigerator, chilling in my refrigerator. A client said she wanted to pay for my services. And I always say my services are totally free for clients, but you can pay me in Google reviews or alcohol. And she brought all of the ingredients for Pisco Sours. And now I'm completely obsessed with that cocktail. So it's like, I have to have a bottle in there at all times, especially with the Texas heat. It is fantastic. It's, it's, uh, it's the perfect so cocktail. And we're going to have 105 next week. Yay. It, it's going it's to be a long, long hot, hot summer, summer here. Yeah. So let's wrap up and let everybody know that you have some materials that they're going to be able to download to help them start thinking about next steps, especially adult children. Yes, absolutely. So first of all, my, my website, carepatrol.com is a really great resource. We have blogs, we have lots of posts, we have videos, there's tons of resources on there. My Facebook page as well. If you just look at care patrol of South Austin, you will find me. I am very regular on there about posting resources and not just like medical resources. I like to post things like, um, you know, Today, there is a link for online book clubs to the Austin Public Library. So things like that. I also have some documents, including my favorite, which is the tour checklist, which is things to ask on tours. It is four pages long. And I've had clients that have literally gone through it one by one, but they're really, really important questions to ask to help you decide what is the best Terrific. place for your Anna, loved one. I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful that we were introduced. This is terrific. So this podcast will be transcribed eventually, and we'll have some show notes and definitely links to all of Anna's social media, her website, and the ability to go to her website and download that uh, tour checkoff list, which I think is amazing. I'm all about the tools. And uh, even if any of you need services from Care Patrol, you heard her say they are available across the USA, except for Nevada. You are always welcome to reach out to Anna first, and she can introduce you to the office that is near you. 
and or, you know, give her some love, give her some feedback for coming on and telling us about her company and her mission. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad we met as well. It's been a pleasure to to talk to you about Care Patrol. Obviously, you can tell I'm very passionate about it. And um, please feel free, anyone out there listening. I hope you found this interview enlightening. Anna McMaster of Care Patrol of Austin is very knowledgeable, and I hope you gained some good information. We will link to her site in the show notes, and you will also find the download for her tour checklist. Four pages of questions to ask if you are shopping for your next assisted living facility. Thank you so much for listening again. I appreciate each of you. This information is here to help you navigate your rehabilitation journey wherever it is you are. Check out the transcript and the show notes. There you will also find a link to download the top tips for aphasia communication and self-care. And if you think you would like to have your loved one be seen for a consultation to see what kind of goals we can accomplish, let me know. There is a link in the show notes. Have a fabulous day. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen for Life podcast. We hope you feel empowered and supported. Head over to listenforlifepodcast.com to see the show notes with links and information from today's episode. Do you have a topic, a resource to share, or a guest recommendation? Inquiring minds want to know. Let us know in the comments section. Wishing you a fabulous week.